Steve Jobs. Most of you probably somewhat familiar with the, with the name. If you're, if you're involved in business at all, I'm sure you are. He was the founder of Apple Computer. And at one point in time, he was trying to recruit John Scully, who was at that time the 38-year-old president of Pepsi-Cola Company. He was trying to recruit him to come and be the president at Apple. They had a lot of discussion, a lot of back and forth, trying to you know, determine salaries and all the rest of it, but Scully was still reluctant. And he, he wasn't sure he really wanted to come until Jobs said this to him. He said, John, do you really want to spend the rest of your life selling sugar water, or do you want to have a chance to change the world? That was a challenge he couldn't pass up, and Scully came on board. But I think it's a critical question that we all need to face. What is it that we're living for? What is it that gives meaning to our life? Has God really just left us to stay here and collect enough money for a hopefully comfortable five-year retirement? And is that really it? We're just occupying time and space until the day he takes us home. Is that what it's all about? Well, there's nothing wrong with preparing for retirement. But that's sugar water, believe me, compared to what the plan is that the Lord really has for our lives. He's left us here for a purpose, and the purpose is to represent Christ in the community, in the world where we live. Whatever our world is, that's our job. And, and it's not just to sell sugar water. You know, the way I would say this is, look, if God has left you here as a believer, he's left you here to change somebody's world. You have a purpose much bigger than what you may think. And that's what this passage of Scripture is all about in Luke 10 through the first 16 verses. As Jesus is embarking now on his journey to Jerusalem, we talked about that the last few weeks, and he's going to take about six months to get from Galilee where he is down to Jerusalem with a couple of back and forths in between. As he's doing that, he commissions 72 of his followers to go before him to prepare the way at various stops along the way. They're doing what believers are meant to do, which is representing Christ to make as compelling as possible the good news that attaches to the fact that Jesus came and died and rose again and was part of history. That's what this text is about. It's about representing Christ to the best possible advantage. And he's going to show us how to do that as we go through here. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at this passage using this outline, the commission, the challenge, the commandments, the conditions, the communication, the conclusion, and the consequences. A bunch of C's, seven C's to be example. Uh, to, to, be, to be clear, that's which is more than the four C's that we're used to, right? So uh, be prepared. But we'll take the first one today, the commission. The commission. Verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. Now, this is an introductory verse to this passage. It gives us the big picture for what it means to have meaning and purpose as a believer. This is our commission. So we want to unpack this passage of Scripture from that standpoint. Let's look at it, first of all, the master of the commission. The master of the commission. Who does the appointing, who establishes the purpose, who gives this instruction to us. Well, Luke says it's the Lord, the Lord. That's an interesting choice of title. It's not used very much in the Gospels to speak of Jesus. On rare occasions, yes. But think about it. Luke here could have used Jesus. He could have said Son of Man. He could have said Christ. But instead, he chooses the title the Lord. The Lord. What does the Lord mean? Well, the Lord is the title that speaks to 
the deity of Christ and that looks at him as master. If somebody was a Lord, he was the master. He was, he was the one who was in authority. He was the one who was in charge. And I think Luke uses that on purpose because when we come to faith in Christ, that's what we now establish Jesus as the Lord of our life. That's what we learned in Romans 10.9, right? He now becomes that to us. And so this phrase, this title is, in, is, in, is intended to emphasize the authority, the majesty, the ownership of the one who is giving this commission. It's the Lord. It's the one to whom we belong because we are no longer our own. In the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, we've been bought with a price. And this one who has bought us and this one to whom we belong now is saying, I have a commission for you. I have a job for you. I want you to represent me in a world that has no other answers. A world that has no other answers. Turn with me to Matthew 28. Just if you're in Luke, just back up past Mark to Matthew 28, last chapter. On his way out, or on his way back to heaven, Jesus says this to his disciples. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. Jesus came and said to them, all authority, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the earth. This is the great commission. It's essentially the commission that Jesus gives to his followers as he is just leaving earth. And by, by application, it passes right on down to all of us who have followed as believers in Christ. But notice how he starts it. He doesn't start it by saying, I want you to go out and make disciples. He doesn't start there. He first reminds them that He's doing this as the source of all authority. He's in charge, beloved, now of everything. They've known him as a man living on earth. They've seen him be humiliated in just about every way there is. And now Jesus is instructing them, guys, listen, things have changed. On the basis of the death and the resurrection that I've been through, the Father has now given me all authority in heaven and earth. I'm in charge of everything. And here's what I want you to do. Here's your part. If you want to be a part of me, I want you to go and make disciples. And he's saying, when he's saying this, he's saying, I'm making this command as your Lord and master. Fail to deliver this. And it tells me one of two things. Either you're in rebellion against the claim that you've made to be my servant, or I'm not really your Lord and master at all. You still are your own Lord and master, in which case you have a much greater problem. One of those two. You know, God gives us all in, in different ways, right? We're not, we're not the same people at all. We're unique. This is one of the wonderful things about the way God does things. We have, we have different gifts. We have different careers, therefore. We have different home lives. We have different ways we look at things. We have different things that we like and that we dislike. We're different. And yet we're alike in this sense, beloved. We all have the same commission from our Lord. We have the same commission to represent him. We will do that in different ways because we are different people. But we have the same end objective. We have the same goal in mind. He issues that command as our Lord and Master and he means business because he loves those who don't really know him, have never come to faith in Christ. And he's very serious about them understanding what it means to come to faith in him. And the greatest privilege we can possibly have is to share the good news of Christ with others that were around. You know, I was thinking about this. I, I was thinking about something I read not too long ago. How would you like to, uh, 
How would you like to get written into a famous novel? You know, like maybe be Rhett Butler's sidekick in, uh, in Gone with the Wind or something like that. Well, there was a guy who, there was a contest, a, a nonprofit organization set up this contest and you could bid to become part of the next Stephen King novel. Not quite Rhett Butler maybe, but you know, it's a, it's a pretty famous writer. And so some guy paid $25,100 to be written into, and I don't remember what novel it was now, and I don't remember the guy's name, but in his mind, I'm sure, he achieved literary immortality by being written into this novel. He was killed off pretty fast, in the book, that is. <laughs> Didn't last very long. But he got written into the book. It's representative of the desire that we all have to be part of a story that's bigger than we are, right? We really do. Deep down, we want our life to mean something. And that's what Jesus is, is, is tapping into here. He's saying, you want to be you want to be part of something big? Join me. And once you've joined me as your Lord and Master, here's what I want you to do. I want you to represent me in all the places that I can't physically go right now, but I want you to be there. And I want you to have the privilege of sharing who I am with others. Charles Spurgeon, you know, the great London preacher, he was told one time about a wealthy woman in his church in London who had claimed to come to faith in Christ, but she would not make her confession public. She was afraid that her friends and her socialite friends would abandon her, that they wouldn't let her be on these committees that she was on, that they looked at her faith as being simplistic and that they would leave her go. Here's what Spurgeon says. He says, she is a traitor to the master who sent her if she is so beguiled by the beauties of taste and art as to forget that to preach Christ and him crucified is the only objective. It's the only objective for which she exists among the sons of men. The business of the church is the salvation of souls. I don't think you can really state it any simpler than that, right? That's the commission that Jesus is giving to those who are his disciples to go out and represent him and to prepare the way for his coming. But he does it as the Lord of all things, including us. Secondly, the ministers of the commission. Who are the ministers of the, commi of the commission? After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. Why does he say others? Well, he's obviously referring to 72 in addition to the 12 who had already been appointed as apostles. Here we now have seven who are sent out at the beginning of, of chapter 9, if you remember. Here we have 72 more. Now, ancient texts, just so your Bible may say 70, ancient texts, that is, versions of the Greek text are almost equally divided between is it 70 or is it 72? And the English translations are almost equally divided. So for example, the ESV and the NIV both say 72. He sent out 72 pairs of people, uh, 72 men. The New American Standard, the New King James, and I think the Holman Bible, a new translation, they all choose 70 as the right number. The point really isn't whether it's 70 or 72, but what, is the, what does that number signify? And the answer is that it signifies the universal participation of those who are followers of Christ and the universal appeal of the message of Christ. Now, I kind of lean toward the number 70. I do that for theological reasons, not because you can go to any text and really determine that. But here's what we know. The number 70 was, would have been very symbolic to the people that were listening to Jesus. If you look in the Old Testament, you'll find out that there were 70 elders who were appointed to help Moses with his task of judgment. Remember that? 70 was the number of men that were part of the Sanhedrin, which was the governing body of the Jews that operated under the auspices of Rome at the time Jesus was on earth. But the Sanhedrin was the main political 
body for the Jewish people, and it numbered 70. 70 was thought to be the number of nations at the time of Christ. And so the number 70 was symbolic, and Luke, who is particularly among all the gospel writers, interested in the universal appeal of the gospel, the universal nature of the gospel. It's not just for Jews, even though it's coming through the Jewish people. It's for everybody. Luke is making a big emphasis of that, and I think that's part of the reason that he emphasizes this particular event, which is not listed elsewhere. It represents the universal nature of the, uh, uh, of the message and of the people who are going to take it to the whole world. Now, the ministers of the commission were these 70 or 72 at that point in time, but beloved, we'll see shortly that they were asked to pray for others to go into the harvest. And I want to suggest to you that by application, some of those others are us, everyone who has followed as a believer in Christ. We all have this commission. The ministers of the commission they're us. Now, I know that we don't all have the gift of evangelism. Some of us do, but not all of us will. And we should not and we need not put that kind of burden of guilt on ourselves. But let me tell you, every one of us as a believer in Christ should know how to help someone else understand what it means to come to faith in Christ to put your trust in Christ. If somebody came to you and said, what is the Bible all about? How could I become a Christian? Would you know how to do that? You know where I'd start? I'd start right where we've been. I'd say, let me show you the basic message of the Bible in four verses from the book of Romans. Now, hopefully you've got those memorized, but you don't have to have them memorized. You can turn right to them, right? Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. One of the basic messages and themes in the Bible is that we are all equally guilty. There's not a person in the world that doesn't know deep down the guilt that they have before God. They're not perfect like God is. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is what? Death, separation from God. So the future of those who have sinned is to be separated from God. But, the wonderful word, word but in the middle of that verse, right? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is hope in Christ because he came and he died and he rose again. He has paid the penalty for our sins. So the possibility of salvation is there. So how do I get that salvation? How do I get in on this? Romans 10, 9. But if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you will be saved with a heart. One believes and is justified and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. You've just learned that, right? There was a reason that we had you learn that. So that you can help someone understand what the Bible is all about and what salvation is all about and what it means to come to faith in Christ. You don't have to send them to an expert. I mean, send them my way. I'm, not that I'm an expert, but I'm happy to talk to them. But you should know how to begin this conversation. On your own. Listen, one verse could do it, right? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's the gospel in a nutshell. There's what the Bible says in a nutshell. You don't have to go to every verse and every chapter and everywhere in the Bible. You can get the basic message by four or five verses. So let me ask you, are you really telling me that it's too much for you to learn four or five verses and have those firmly in mind so that you can represent Christ in the world to which he's called you? Surely that's not too much. We can all do that, and we must to prepare to be ministers of the commission. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to see that you really are a minister of the commission. Ephesians 
chapter 4. Some of you may go back with us long enough to remember this, but remember in beginning in verse 11 how he says this. He says, and he, God, the Father, gave the apostles, the prophets, the, the evangelists, the shepherds, which means pastors and teachers. So these are all church leaders. He gave the church leaders. Why? So that they could do all the work, right? Is that what he says? I mean, that's what we think, right? That's where we go. Pastor of the church, yeah, he, I mean, he's the guy that does, uh, we all, some of us help a little bit, but that's, he's the guy. That's not what it says at all, is it? He gave the leaders to do what? Verse 12, to equip the saints. Who's the saints? Go back to chapter one, verse one. It's all believers. If you're not a believer, you're not a saint, but if you are a believer, you're a saint. You may not act like a saint because you don't live up to your name, but you're a saint. To equip the saints for the work of what? Of ministry. Who are the ministers? We all are. We're all ministers of the commission, beloved. That's the way God intended the church to work, and we share equally in the responsibility to be ministers of the commission on this corner in Eaton, Colorado, in the year 2014, and for however long God leaves us here, we have a responsibility that we will one day answer to the Lord for. Now we do it in different ways. You know, some of us preach, some of us teach, some of us open our home for Bible study, some of us teach the Bible study, some of us inviting other people, we're just, you know, very friendly really good at that. Some of us help. Some of us build. Some of us maintain. Some of us do all kinds of, some of us bring the food, thankfully. I mean, there's just a million ways that we can minister the gifts that God has given us, right? But we all have a responsibility to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have met the ministers and they are us. This is the golden opportunity not to waste our lives selling sugar water by representing Christ, taking him wherever we go. There was, I came across this quote one time. I thought it was fascinating. There was a, it was a, a guy named Lucian. He was an unbelieving Greek philosopher, not a believer at all. He's living in the cent second century. He observed firsthand the warm fellowship of some of the Christians who lived around him, and he wrote this. He said, it is incredible to see the fervor with which the people of that religion help each other in their wants. They spare nothing. Their first legislator, by which he means Jesus, has put it into their heads that they are brethren. Isn't that what Jesus said? This New commandment I give you to love one another. By this shall I men know that you love one another. But that you're my disciples because you have love one for another and it works. He commissioned us as his representatives and these early believers did it so superbly. I wonder what the historians who write the history of Eton someday will say about how well we did. Will they be able to make a statement like that? More importantly, how will God write the history of our time here? Because we're the ministers and we have a responsibility. So what's the mission of the commission? The mission of the commission. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. It's not hard to identify the mission, is it? These guys were sent to prepare the way for Jesus. As time was growing short for him to be on this earth, he was interested that everybody be reached that could possibly be reached. And so rather than just going himself and taking the little entourage that followed him around, he sent these out ahead of him. He told them he wanted to go and to open the discussion you know, to break down physical and spiritual and emotional barriers before Jesus 
came to town to prepare the way for him to do everything in their power to make known the person of Christ, to make the gospel clear and compelling. Now, in the case of these guys, Jesus was obviously following up. He couldn't possibly have gotten all the places that seven, this combination of 72 plus 12 other apostles were going. Couldn't have gotten to all of them, but he undoubtedly got to many of them. Yet there would be some where he could not personally go. And by extension, we said this commission goes to us as well. And we know that Jesus is not following personally and physically to the places where we go. So how does this all work? How does this work? Now, there are two passages that, kind of, that capture my attention in this regard. And I want you to, to look at them with me. The first one is in Ephesians. If you're still there in chapter 4, just turn back to chapter 2. Chapter 2. Paul says this in Ephesians 2 and verse 17. He says, and he, and if you go back, you'll see that the antecedent for that is Jesus, he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Now let me ask you a question. Did Jesus ever go and preach in Asia Minor where Ephesus was located? Did he? No. So how can Paul say he came and preached peace to you? What is Paul saying? What Paul is saying is that when the believers, when the Christians like himself and others came and preached the gospel, it was as though Christ himself came. So when he says Christ came and preached peace to you, he's saying in representing him, we become him to certain people. And it's our responsibility to be representing him in the best possible way. Listen, you can look at it this way. But you are the only Christ that some people are ever going to see. Some people that you know are never going to walk into a church. Your gospel is going to be the only gospel they're ever going to hear. They're never going to hear it anywhere else. They're never going to flip through the channels and stop on one of those. There are certain people in your life that will either hear the message of Christ through you or they won't hear it at all. That's why Jesus is so concerned that we take this commission seriously. Now let me give you one other passage. It's in Matthew 11. Matthew 11. So just back up again to Matthew. First book in the New Testament, chapter 11. Beginning in verse 11. This is just, this is really an incredible statement that Jesus makes here. He has the audacity, audacity to say this. He says, in, in Matthew 11, verse 11, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has, not a, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Jesus put him right at the top of the heap. Think about that. That puts him over Adam, above Abraham, above David, above Daniel, above Isaiah. He's over everybody. It's come. There's nobody any greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What in the world was Jesus saying? Of course, by kingdom of heaven, he's talking about the kingdom that began when he came. So all believers in this age, from the time of Christ on, are part of the kingdom of heaven Already, and he's saying everyone who is part of that kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. How can he say that? Are, are we greater preachers than John the Baptist? God forbid. Are we, are, are we, do we have better character than John the Baptist? Are we somehow more devoted to God than John the Baptist? I mean, look at his life and you'll realize that's not going to happen. So what does Jesus mean? Here's what he means, beloved. He means that everybody from the time of Jesus on knows the gospel 
in a far greater sense than John the Baptist or anyone who ever came before him knew that. That's what he means. Now, some have said, well, we're greater because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. But you check the scripture and you'll find out John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. So it's not that. It's the fact that we know the gospel in a way he doesn't. And what does Paul say about the gospel? The gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. That's the power of God for salvation. That's what brings people to Christ. That's what's going to get people to heaven. That's what makes people right with God. It's the gospel. And we know the gospel in a way that John never did. With John in the Old Testament prophets, They knew the gospel only in a dim way. We know it in full. They knew that there had to be some way, somehow, that there would be someday a permanent sacrifice for sin. They knew that. We know it was Jesus, right? They knew there was coming a great anointed one, one day who would be the ruler of everything. We know that it's Jesus. They knew that Messiah would be a man. We know that he's way more than a man. He's the God-man. He's Jesus. They could not reconcile the suffering Messiah that they found in Isaiah 53 with the great son of man of Daniel 7. They couldn't put those together. That's one of the reasons the Jews in Jesus' time were so confused. They couldn't see it. What do we know? We know that both of those are fulfilled in the person of Jesus, that he's both, and that he's represented in two advents to earth, not just one. The first time as the suffering Messiah, the second time as the great dominating Son of Man, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Do you see the point? We know the gospel. We have the big picture. We understand now what the sacrificial system is all about. Hebrews takes us all the way through the whole thing and shows us how Jesus is the fulfillment of all of it. And we know that. When I was in the fifth grade, Revolutionary War, I know some of you were thinking that, might as well say. I was in the fifth grade. They came through and they did this thing they did most years, they tested eyes, right? And when they tested my eyes, they said, you need glasses. And they gave me some kind of note to take home. And I destroyed it. Now, I didn't regularly make a practice of that, but I knew, listen, with all good intention, we were a poor family. And I figured, we don't have money to buy glasses. I'm just going to make sure my folks don't get this. And so I did. I destroyed the note. I didn't really mind wearing glasses. I just didn't think we should... The mom and dad should have to buy those. Well, the next year they did the same thing and they tested again, sixth grade. This time they knew, they, you know, they had on record that they gave me the note the year before. They kind of figured out what happened. So they called my mom and dad. And they said, that guy needs glasses. So the next thing I knew, I found myself sitting in, a, in the eye doctor's getting a, an eye exam and being fitted for glasses, right? And two weeks later, mom took me down. We got those glasses, I put them on. And we drove down the main street of Hutchinson, Kansas. And I can remember this vividly to this day. I mean, I saw things I had never seen before. It was wonderful. It was terrific. It was incredible to be able to see. Everything came into focus. I could actually read the signs. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying with the first coming of Christ and with the death, and the resurrection which they had never understood, and the ascension back to the Father, and the promise of a second coming, everything came into focus. Do you see, it's like like turning the knob on 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 a microscope or on a telescope and bringing it all into focus. That's what the first coming of Christ did. It brought the gospel into a focus and into a clarity that had never been there before, a focus that was unimaginable before that. So we have information, we have knowledge, we have precious knowledge of how to know God that even those in the Old Testament didn't have. This is why Peter says in 1 Peter 1, beginning at verse 10, he says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, 
inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Peter's saying they kept looking, they kept searching, they kept trying to understand, but they couldn't quite put it all together. But that's exactly what we can do now. And so he's saying the least believer in this age is greater than Elijah and Daniel and Moses all rolled into one. Why? Because we can see what they couldn't see. We can understand what they couldn't understand. The vague outlines that they saw, we see with pristine clarity. And with that comes great responsibility, right? With great privilege comes great responsibility to share who Christ is. Prepare the way for Jesus into the lives and hearts of other people. Fourthly, the might of the commission. The introduction here wouldn't be complete without looking at the power of the commission. The 70 or 72, and thus by extension are appointed to the task. But the Lord, listen, you need to get this. The Lord in no way expects us to produce the results. Expects us to share the message. He doesn't expect us to produce the results. The results come from him. They can only come from him. Salvation involves the removal of blinders, as we were talking about in our Sunday school class this morning, from, from eyes that are blinded. It involves the change of heart that can only be done by the Holy Spirit, but we can be the instrument for that. Do you see? He wants us to be the instrument for that. He wants us to be the one bringing the message so that the Holy Spirit can do the work of uncovering the eyes and opening the eyes to the greatness. Look at verse 17 of Luke 10. Verse 17 the 72 returned with joy. So this is after the fact now. 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They didn't do it in their own power. They didn't do it by their own might. They did it in his name. And beloved, that's all Jesus is asking us to do. Represent, just obey. Just take the message. Just be faithful. Just share what's so unbelievably great, greatest message anybody could have, right? Just share that. If people come to faith in Christ, great. If they don't, that's not on you, that's on him. He does the miracles. He's just waiting for us to believe and obey. Let me give you one example. Alexander Grigolia. There's a name for you, but the reason he had that name, he came from Russia in the early 20th century. Brilliant man. He had to learn English from scratch. He didn't know a word when he first came to the United States. He, he went on to earn not just one, but three doctorates. So that tells you something about his brilliance. Brilliant man. He began teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. But with all of his brilliance and with his three PhDs behind his name, he realized, you know what, there's something missing. There's something missing. Alexander Grigolia felt in his life. Well, one day he was out getting his shoes polished. Had a shoe shine, you know, guy there doing that. And he, and he noticed as he's getting his shoe shine, man, this, this guy's doing the most menial of tasks. He's down there rubbing and shining away on those shoes, but he seems happy and it seems genuine and he's really, he's really happy. So he asked him, he finally said to him, you know, how can you, what, what makes you so happy? And he, he, was, he was kind of mad. What makes you so happy? You know what the guy said? He, he didn't preach a sermon. He didn't preach a sermon. He didn't give a lecture in apologetics. He didn't give him three reasons why God is real and, you know, four reasons why the resurrection happened or anything like that. He just said this. He said to Dr. Gregolia, he said, Jesus, 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 Jesus is what makes me happy. Jesus came and died so that God could forgive my badness and that makes me happy and that's why I'm happy. That's all he said. Simple. But let me tell you, he knew something that Elijah didn't know. He knew something that Moses didn't know. He knew something that Daniel didn't know. The simple boot black knew that. You and I know that. 
And it's our responsibility to make sure that those around us know that. That's the commission. That's simple. We make it complex. None of us has an excuse. You know what happened to Dr. Gregolia? He walked away from there very angry. This guy would say, oh, sure, Jesus, yeah, yeah, sure, Jesus. He stormed away. But this three-time PhD who heard this, just the simplest possible presentation of the gospel, couldn't, he couldn't quite walk away from truth. It worked on him. It worked on his mind until he began to think, well, maybe I should investigate this a little further. And he began to read the Bible. He began to read about who Jesus really was. You know what I found? Most people who reject Jesus don't even have a clue who he is. They don't. They just have a thing in their mind. People have a thing in their mind about who God is. They don't really know because where's he found? He's found in the Word. And this guy, he began to read the Gospels. And he, the more he read, the more he got intrigued, and the more he investigated, and the more he began to talk to others, and he began to study. And the long story short, he became a believer. He eventually moved. He moved from the University of Pennsylvania over to Wheaton College, great Christian college there in Illinois. And he became, or he became the favorite professor of anthropology for a young man named Billy that was going to school there, a young man named Billy Graham. All because a boot black commissioned to tell the story of Jesus was faithful and carried out his mission. That's what Jesus is asking us to do, beloved. Just be faithful. Represent me. Let people know who you stand for. So the question is, do you, you, know, you want to sell sugar water? Or do you want to go out and let the Lord use you to change a life? Let's go change lives. Let's do that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the word. Lord, at the, at, at the, the possibility of oversimplifying, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I've ever counseled anyone that, that it really, the problem, whatever the problem came down to, didn't come down to either they didn't even know you as Savior and Lord, had no concept of what it meant to submit their lives to Christ and obey the commands of the Word of God gladly and enthusiastically because they loved you. Or they were Christians, but they, weren't, they were in disobedience. They were doing the things you asked them not to because they thought they knew better. Sin always brings unhappiness. Sin always is at the core of our problems. Here you are, Lord, just asking us, believe in me, trust in me, come to me, live for me, represent me. What a privilege. Greatest privilege we could possibly have. I pray this morning, Father, that you will stir our hearts as we go through this passage, these next verses, and look deeper into what this means and how we can do it. Lord, that you'll just you'll challenge our hearts. <clears throat> to be to the world in which we live, to be Christ in the world in which, in which we live. What a privilege. Help us to do it well, I pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.